Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. This is episode number 39 and this is our big 2018 Essen preview. Ooh. I was going to go with some joke about you being really old and like, have we even passed your age yet? You uh, know? No, we have passed my age. So. Dang it. Missed the joke as usual. Uh, I will not be tending your 40th birthday. Um, yeah, you won't be. That's right. <laughs> you are certainly not on the guest list. I was going to say because I'm too cool to go to <laughs> yeah. a 40 year old to an old person's party. <laughs> but but wow. We're defining our friendship um over the air. Right. Okay, let's All hammer right. this out. Let's just take the next couple minutes and just figure out Let's talk where about we stand. who likes who. So <laughs> yeah, okay. we have to vote one of the three of us out. Right. Three, two, one. Kellark. God, uh, Phelan. 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 All right, so we have locked um, eyes. This is going to be a uh, two-person podcast yeah, from now on. Uh, can we shut I... off Kellen's mic? Well, I don't know. No as longer. far as I can tell, I'm the only one that got no votes, so I feel like I'm the only one staying. You're going to do a one-person <laughs> podcast? <laughs> exactly. It's what, Who's going to well, listen the, to we, that? The Your people girl, I, get to, <laughs> I feel like I get to like be in some of it if I only got one vote. That's Kellen fair. is definitely exiled. That's yeah, clear. Kellen's out. Mark's there half the time. Right. I'm doing the rest of it. So yeah, so this is going to be another top five list from us, uh, and we're going to be going over the five games that we're most excited for that will be debuting at the Essen Spiel, I guess it's called, right? Uh, yeah, right. where it's Essen this weekend, and we're recording this live from Los yeah, Angeles. That's right, that's right. The sister city to Essen. Yes, pretty much. As it's, as it's known. Basically the same place. But before we do that, you know what we're going to do? Talk about board games. Talk about games. Talk about games that we have been playing yeah so i'll kick this off we played a game of spqf um so this is a indie deck building game and i have now played it at every player count of two three and four players this is a deck building game a la glory to rome where every action that you take you can follow other players can follow your action for sort of a lesser version of that the game is quite complicated in its iconography I guess it's most interesting mechanism that it adds to deck building, and I'm sure this has been done before, but the cards that you can't use on your turn become available to be purchased by other players. So you're trying to figure out how to use most of your cards or the cards that you want to keep in your deck forever. Otherwise, you kind of have to set them out for an entire turn. And what's interesting is the economy, like in a Dominion game where everything costs money, in this game you actually just get a free recruit at the end of your turn. Right. So if the card is out there, someone is likely going to take it. This is a, a an indie production. There's cool art, but it's kind of hard to interpret sometimes. It's a little muddled a little yeah. bit. Um, this is definitely not a game right out the bat, I'll say it, I would recommend to everyone. But I started reading about it, started hearing from the designer on Twitter, and there's just something Chudiak-esque in it Certainly. somewhere. Yeah, for sure. This is fun. I think I like this at two, substantially better than at three and four, based on sort of my first pass through the player counts. What did you guys think? I, I liked, like you were saying, like the lack of card buying economy. I, I mean, the idea that not every card is of equal value, but the cards are sort of roughly of the same value, but just very extremely situational. Uh, and you just pick one that you're going to be taking from other people. The fact that cards are filtering in and out of your deck, because you're trying to get cards of a specific type, and you might have to give those up if they're not as valuable as other cards you might play at the end of your turn. So there's kind of this interesting decision of like cards filtering in and out of your deck and going to other players' decks that I thought was pretty interesting. Pretty cool. You said this game plays in about 30 minutes typically or that was that's like the number in the box yeah there were some comments online from other reviewers that once you know it you're just flying through it okay um which i think makes sense because you only play one card i mean there are things that modify that but you play one card on your turn that can sort of be amplified right by the other cards in your hand our game took a little longer than that i think it took about an hour if this game ended up playing quicker upon repeated plays i think that would be the reason i would play it because otherwise i'd rather play glory to rome or Matani. I think they're just better versions of what this game is trying to get across. But if this game ended up running more quickly, then I think I'd be more into it. So as a compare contrast to Matainai, and Carl Chudiak is my man or my doctor, I might say. Um, Honorary. He's an honorary doctor. As a compare contrast to Matainai specifically, there's something intuitive about Glory to Rome from the sense that you're building buildings, you're putting stone into them. And even in this game, which is SPQF from an iconography perspective, you're still building a civilization, which like makes sense 
Matainai is this sort of on the left side you put your works for sale and on the right side people come the gift shop thing. visit yeah. them yeah. and yeah. like it makes less sense thematically right so as someone who loves Chudiak I've actually gotten rid of Matainai because I just it didn't make sense to me sure uh, and Glory I, to Rome is substantially longer interesting but. I couldn't agree more like I did not give Matainai much of a chance to be fair but I was decidedly not into it after the couple of plays I had it I haven't tried Glory to Rome I feel like based on everything you guys are saying I really absolutely should but yeah, it, I see the comparison of SPQF to Montana specifically and that multi-use card and just those follow mechanics. But it certainly, it made a lot more sense to me off the bat. Like there were like teething problems with figuring out exactly what the rules were and how the iconography worked. But uh, once we got into the flow of it, everything I was doing intrinsically made sense. Like you said, you're collecting resources, you're spending them to upgrade civilization, you know, that sort of thing. I think for me, Montana, although the theme is certainly pasted on and, and even the pasted on theme doesn't really make too much sense i feel like it's just a richer game like upon repeated plays matainai you'd have more interesting strategies to try and i think the cards are a little deeper than this game is i feel like this game the cards are pretty straightforward which is fine which is a, a pro in and of itself but uh, i think i would slightly prefer matainai yeah so that is just another card game that i sort of like from the multi-use action perspective but i think that's enough for us to cover this is an indie game it's 50 dollars for a small card game it's likely won't be available in, in like two or three months. Right. Um, I guess it could be reprinted in a couple of years by a bigger publisher similar to some of his other designs. I also know that the designer is still selling a handful of copies. Probably, who knows if they'll still be around by the time you hear this, but yeah, it's That's still available. S-P-Q-F. Just rolls off the tongue. It's easy to say. <laughs> Spakoof. Spakoof. Sp- Sp- oh, that was good. Your sound pronunciation. Yeah, so, yeah, not so. your voice sucks. Mark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Blanket statement. <laughs> so I filled a gap in my Uwe Rosenberg catalog by playing La Havre, which is a game I hadn't played before. This sort of falls along the lines of his other farming games, although it's not a farming game. It's more of a city building game, but it takes a lot from uh, Agricola and Caverna. It's a resource gathering slash conversion uh, which he's known for and which those two games feature. Um, and this is definitely a midweight Euro game. Yeah, I'd say midway. I mean, I think it's, if you consider Agricola and Caverna midway, which I think I would, maybe mid to heavy. I think the definition of midway has moved Shifted. a little bit. Sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, obviously midway is sort of nebulous in and of its, like, inherently nebulous saying midway. So, mm. oh, sorry? No. Okay. Bad joke that we missed out on? It was going to be something like midway between, like, me and one of you, whereas, like, I'm on oh. the top. Okay. Well, too bad we missed way. that. I feel like that would have been a crucial joke. But Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just sort of fill in the gap there. Right, right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, I don't got you. So again, this is a Rosenberg resource gathering conversion game of the three of Agricola and Caverna. The rule set is the simplest. When you move the turn marker, resources are added to the board. And then on your turn, you can either take resources from any of the spots on the board that have accumulated turn by turn. Or you can use your one worker. You only have one worker to occupy and use a building in the game, either one of your own buildings or one of your opponent's buildings or one of the shared city buildings. Uh, If you use a shared or your opponent's buildings, you either pay the game or you pay your opponent. Uh, That's one feature of this game that I like a lot. I like the ability to use other people's buildings. I always find that sort of interesting. Uh, And you can sort of also camp out in somebody's building so you can prevent other players or them from using their own building, which is a cool and that's, function. And that's where if you have bought the building, right, you don't get a bonus if you use it? Or how does it work? If you buy the building and you use it, you don't have to pay for it. Mm. right? You don't have to pay for the use of the building. But if, say, Neilan has a building and I want to use it, I pay, pay him. You. Yeah, okay. But if I pay him, I can also choose to leave my worker there for future turns and then he can't access it because my worker is sitting on there. So, that's, so there's a little bit of a aggressive worker placement thing there that I find cool. And there's also, because it's a Rosenberg game, there's a feed your workers at the end of every seven turns or round aspect, uh, which makes the game tight. As far as tightness goes, it's not quite as tight as Agricola, but it's tighter than Caverna, so it fits in really nicely there. I feel like Agricola is too tight, especially when you play with more experienced players than yourself, and Caverna is a little too loose. You can never really feel like you're struggling with Caverna, and it makes the game a little less fun to me. And so I think for me, it's probably... I've only played it once, but it's probably right up there from one of my favorite Rosenberg games. I think it may be my favorite. I think I would play it before either Agricola or Caverna. 
Remind me, have you played Defeat for Odin? I have, yes. You have, and you like yeah. it a lot more than that? I like it more than that. Um, and where does that fit? Sorry, just to... Uh, in, in the ranking yeah, for me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we're I, ranking like good games. <laughs> I think Feast for Odin is probably my second favorite. Okay. I think so. I think Caverna would be next and then Agricola. But they're all really good games. Obviously, all these games are really, really sound and really solid games. But Lahav has like the most components yeah. that have to be condensed into like little spaces. There's so many people online who've like made containers or made little uh, right. extra things and I, to store all the fish, which is great because I traded for this game and the person who had uh, the game before me made like uh, all these great like little containers. So That's it's like awesome. perfect. But yeah, if you like Rosenberg games and for some reason like me, you had not played Lahav, I would very strongly recommend it. It's a fantastic game if you're looking for that Rosenberg goods gathering convergent thing that it is so well. So Lahav is it long? It is on the longer side. I, I wouldn't say it's long. And also, it plays really well at two. I played it at two, which is something I don't like doing for games that are not expressly two-player games. But it was it played really, really well. But it, even at that count, it was on the long side. There is a short version of the mm-hmm. game. In the short version, the game is obviously shorter. But you start with a, a lot of resources. And part of the fun is getting that, getting that get an up. engine okay. built up. Yeah. Well, and that's funny. There is a two-player version of this. Oh, log, right. Inland Port the, the inland or something? Port, yeah. Have you played that? I have not. Okay, yeah, I, just I don't know how the, much played the full game. Right. Okay. But this is one of those ones that I keep my eye on just because there are a lot of advocates for it yeah. on BGG who are like it feels a little bit different than some of the traditional Rosenberg flair. Yeah, I th- yeah, I think so because there's a lot of similarity between Agricola and Caverna obviously like they're almost like the same game but like Caverna being version 2.0. Uh, but this is markedly different. This is clearly a different sort of animal. Except it has a loan mechanic in it. Yes. Loans, Yuck. Loans. That is Save awful. your money, guys. <laughs> Retire on time. <laughs> That's just some good advice. That's <laughs> just some good life advice. <laughs> Board games just, aside. Re- Retire games on time. Yeah. <laughs> That's just Kellen's financial yep. advisory corner. Yeah, that could be another podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. Would we want to be? No. What's that? You need well, you guys us? just voted me out like five minutes ago. Oh, we voted you out and now you're taking Oh, this is your chance. new podcast. Yeah, I'm taking all this stuff with me. That was a hop. Okay, I'm going to talk about Scythe, The Rise of Fenris. So this is the latest and last expansion for Scythe, uh, at least the last of the box expansion. I believe there are still like promos and additional add-ons he's doing. It is a campaign expansion primarily. It includes a bunch of modules which can be used in the base game of Scythe if you choose to do it that way. But I would say the best way to do this is to play it as a campaign, which sort of slowly unlocks these modules in a legacy-like way in that you're opening boxes and uncovering new components and being wowed at what's in there and excited to like add them to your next game. There's a story, which is actually a pretty decent little story over the course of the campaign where you're sort of interested to see where it goes and how that relates to the game. Overall, I really enjoyed this. I hadn't played Scythe in a little bit, and this sort of reinvigorated my interest in it. It's interesting because I played this as a two-player campaign, and this perhaps reiterated that Scythe While it works weirdly well at two-player, it's definitely not the optimal way to play that. And I think if I were to do this over, I probably would have tried to bring in a third or a fourth player. That said, if you had any sort of interest in Scythe or you have all the expansions at this point or still on the fence about this one, I'd highly recommend it. Get like a regular group of people, play through the campaign. It, It adds a lot of really interesting elements and it sort of adds that excitement about sort of wanting to progress in the campaign, which is, you know, like I said, very typical of legacy games, but entirely resettable and reusable in a way that I would actually be really interested to take the modules from this and use them in a regular game of Scythe. I think that one of the only ways to sort of talk about this in any sort of consequence for people that are perhaps not interested in if spoilers don't mean anything to you or if for whatever reason you know this content and just want my opinion on it, uh, I think it's going to make sense for me to talk about this in spoiler terms. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to add this to the end of the episode so right after the outro music, right after the tag, there'll be another spoiler warning and I'm going to talk like for a minute or a bit about my thoughts on the stuff that is specific to that gets unlocked in the campaign. So before we get into our top five Essen releases, we're going to read another review. That's what we're going to do. So this review comes from Posty Pete, one, two, three, and it reads as follows. My new fave. What's not to like here, folks? These are three dudes who love board games, check, and love taking the piss out of each other when discussing said games. Each host has their own preferences in types of games they like and dislike, and they aren't afraid to tell each other why the others are wrong, which I do often. 
uh, to Callum specifically. I'm really glad to have discovered the podcast. Keep the episodes coming, boys. Still haven't decided which tank color to pick. Posty Pete, the answer to that is green. But kidding aside, thank you so much. That is a great... Yeah, that's a great uh, review. Yeah, great review. Thanks so much. And uh, I, I don't know that I could have a supporter of Red Tank named Posty Pete. See, Posty? This is what that's I'm talking about. Why. That's why you should go green. I mean, if you want your first follower to be Posty Pete, I'm sorry, be my first? best. I'm sorry, first? Be my guest. There are a legion of green tanks out there, Kellen. I think I said be my best, <laughs> <laughs> which is not my finest your, comment. Your weapon flow was a little off there. <laughs> Terrible. Right. So, yes. So, do what Posty Pete did and review us uh, wherever you find us, especially Apple Podcasts, which seems to be the best place to do so. Also, I also want to give a quick heads up that BGG Secret Santa has officially started as of today. You do that? I do do that, yeah. I like it a lot. Um, That's cool. Yeah, this is a Secret Santa where you sign up for it and you're paired with some other random BGG user and uh, you look at their wish list, you set up your own wish list, and uh, they send you a game and you send somebody else a game. The only thing to keep in mind if you're interested, if you're thinking about doing it is that they ask you to spend around $50 total for the game plus shipping. So just keep that in mind if that's what your budget is going to allow. I've done it now three years in a row, and I've always had good experiences. Uh, and it's fun to like look at a random person's like wish list and try to like craft a, a nice little present for them. So yeah, uh, BGD Secret Santa, if you're interested, check out Board Game Geek. I just want to point out that you've also never gotten me a Christmas present. <laughs> Is it true? You're but buying gotten... random BGG people uh, Christmas presents? Well, Neil, are, have are you they ever getting gotten... invited to your parties, Mark? Have you ever well, gotten a Christmas present from him? I haven't. I haven't. Eh, that says all I need to say. Why are we recording this together? <laughs> yeah. uh, can I change my vote to before... kick Mark? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> no, it's already been it's already been written down. That's it. You can't go back. So let's move on from that contentious topic to another one, which is our top five most anticipated games at the upcoming Essen Con, which is going on starting Thursday. Is that right? Yep. This so week? when this episode drops, drops yeah. yeah, it'll be the first day. Oh, of, yeah. First day of Essen. Uh, if you're at the con and you're listening to the show, by all means, write us at uh, boardgamebarrage uh, at gmail.com or tweet at us and let us know how it's going or, and, and if you're uh, running into any interesting games or if you played any of these games, which are we going to list starting now? So Yeah, because I mean, I think it's worth saying that information is maybe not super forthcoming on a lot of these games. So if you've played one of them or you have more information than we do on them, like, please let by us know. By all means, yeah, definitely. So let's kick it off. Anybody want to start? Yeah, I can start this. Okay, my number five is sort of like the wild card on my list. This is the one I know the least about, but tentatively pretty interested in. Uh, this is Magna Storm by Fearland Spieler. So they're the makers of Terra Mystica, Gaia Project, Feast for Odin. Um, I believe that's where Uwe Rosenberg is primarily. I'm not sure. But regardless, the premise for this game is interesting. You're sort of on a, this planet called Magna Storm, which is the worst name for nice. a planet ever but you're like scouting the planet in these sort of like dune buggies you're sort of roaming around it collecting resources it's described as a very low luck high, very tactical game with a lot of interaction where you're sort of competing for territories on the on the surface collecting resources and setting up these little stations which are these adorable little sort of almost turtle looking like mechanized stations and it's got this interesting kind of where it's more of like a race game than sort of your typical euro victory point game where you're racing to get 20 points but the way that the economy works is that you're sort of slowly building up and then sort of siphoning off your economy to turn them into points so it's not just about building and building and building and building you sort of have to regularly sort of like destroy your engine to some extent to score okay um which is just kind of an interesting idea and i i generally kind of like race games as a concept and this seems like a really interesting heavy euro take on that so uh yeah nice that's magna storm it sounds like a crazy words clue gone right. wrong <laughs> it sounds, yeah it's <laughs> such true. a terrible name i'll go to my number five my number five is by friedman freese this is futuretopia don't know too much about this the one thing is obviously it's friedman freese who doesn't always hit for me, but always is interesting at the very least. So I'm interested in that. And this is touted as a little to no luck economic game, which I like, although it's also been called potentially power gritty, which, as I said on the last show, I'm not that big a fan of. The only reason I don't like power grid is the whole thing about it reining you in and, and disincentivizing you for taking the lead early. Other than that, I, I like power grid a lot. I like the economic side of it. So Future Topia has an interesting theme as well. And Freedom Freeze always has interesting themes. The theme of this is like the future is a utopia. And what the human race is trying to do is like automate everything. So you're trying to get 
your civilization fully automated so all your people can just relax all day, which is sort of a funny thing. And I'm sure the artwork, Friedman Freeze artwork is always sort of tongue in cheek. So Futuretopia, I'm sold on it on the Friedman Freeze thing and the no luck economic. Aspect. Yeah, the no luck thing kind of freaked me out sure. just a little bit, but this almost made my list. I love Friedman Freeze, but not enough to make him a doctor. Okay. <laughs> no honorary doctorate. No honorary doctorate from Callan. All right, my number five, and this is a little bit of a cheat because this game has been out since 2001. I have just never heard of it um, and saw a new edition from a company called Open Play, but that's open apostrophe N, so there's two Ns, open mm, play games. No, there's no games at the end, so it's just open mm, (laughs) play. Uh, And this game is called Big Shot. Uh, You actually may have played this at some point. Um, It's designed by Alex Randolph, who designed Ricochet Robots, Incognito, Code 77, some other wow. interesting games. Okay. But it is described as a very, very, very mean auction game uh, with some area control and area influence. This Korean company, Open Play, has made a very beautiful, really simple edition of it that just grabbed me as I was looking at images of it. I love auction games. This is sitting at a 6.5 on BGG. But when you start getting into it, there's a lot of people saying things like, hidden gem you know this doesn't get talked about nearly enough this is really good very quick game i'm excited to uh, pick this one up so uh, that is big shot from open game (laughs) i that doesn't ring or open and play (laughs) uh that doesn't ring a bell so this is a game that's been around for a while you said this is like 2001 and the art before is hideous Mm -hmm. and this new art I'm really excited it's just pretty i absolutely love ricochet robots and what else other games did you say you made uh, Incognito. Incognito is, is at least interesting. It's weird, yeah. but it's interesting. But Rick and Share Robots is one of my most played games. Twixt. Code 777. Seven. Okay. That's an interesting deduction game. Okay. There's a lot of interesting games. And so, yeah, I'd be interested. That's, that's, yeah. yeah. I, it just, um, it was interesting to me that I saw it, started reading about it, and then it was, wow, this is old. Right. I hate the idea that modern games have somehow just, you know, this is a simple auction game, right? Right. right it, right. it can go toe to toe with something new, yeah. Perhaps for sure. I agree. And I can't defend it because I haven't. I know nothing about it. Okay. <laughs> Wait, you didn't read the rules for all of these games? <laughs> I actually did open the rule book for one of them. Yeah. One out of five. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's good. That's more than I would have expected. Okay, my number four is Gugong. Uh, I believe this used to be called The Forbidden City before it was renamed. Uh, This was a Kickstarter game. It is designed by Andreas Steding, who is the designer of Hansa Teutonica, a game I haven't played, but I've heard really, really good things about. The first thing I was super striking about this is just how beautiful it looks. It's got these pretty bright, vibrant colors. It's set in the Chinese Ming Dynasty, and it's kind of got this... I've heard it described as like Trajan or sort of Great Western Trail, and that's sort of these interconnected mini-games. I haven't played either of those, so I don't really know that much about how that how true that is but what i like about the action mechanic for this is that the way that works is you have a hand of cards and on your turn um you'll play a card to one of the action spots on the board those action spots also have a card that's next to them but you have to play a card that's higher than the one over there and then you take the card back from it you can play a card that's lower but then you get a penalty for doing so and then your turn is taking the action on the card that you played and of the spot that you played it to. So there's just kind of, it feels like a lot there to think about. And there's a bunch of different sort of interconnected systems that are, like I said, these sort of different areas of the board that represent these sort of smaller, like, mechanical mini games. It's a beautiful looking game. It's a cool theme. Uh, I like the way that it looks and plays, uh, that it seems to play at least. I haven't read too much of the rules for it. And I, I certainly don't remember as much as I did back when I backed it. But I'm super excited for this one. And I believe it's going to be available um, at Essen. Yeah, this this just missed my list. Yeah, the pedigree with the designer of Hansa mm-hmm. Tonica really struck me. That is Gugong. Does it seem like a game I'd like? Um... Oh, I was joking. No. <laughs> um, okay, my number four is Shadows Amsterdam. Uh, oh, I've been to Essen, boys. <laughs> Wait, what? I've already played this. Oh, okay. Without you, this is, how I... about that? There was a party <laughs> and neither of you were invited. <laughs> okay, so then you can tell me. So I heard this sounded as Codenames Meets Mysterium, but real time. Is that also right? That is all correct. Okay. And you, what do you think about this? Yeah, thing? it's very interesting. It it reminded me of Muse, which is another party game that just sort of mashes other party games together in my mind. It was fun. I think because it was real time, it was much harder to make 
clever connections like in code names right you, like and it was more like this card is similar in color to where we want you to go on the board so essentially the way that it works is two captains are trying to get your team to go to four spaces on the board right. and avoid like six other spaces. And the spaces have a Mysterium Picture, slash Mysterium Dixit pictures, sort correct. of picture. Yeah. But the clues you're giving are also Mysterium slash Dixit pictures. Right. So you're looking at 10 of them at the same time the other captain is looking at the same 10, but you have different cards, a la code names. Right. The cards that they want their team to go to is different. So you start at the middle and you can either move one or two spaces out from the middle. Right. If you give them two cards, that means you need to go two spaces. One card is one space. So if it's one card, one space, that could only be three options. So it's really like a quick hit. We were wondering if you even needed to play it real time. That's what I was going to ask you because when I first heard about this game and I first looked over the rules, I missed the real time part of it, but I, I still was interested at that point. And then I realized that it's also real time and that just made it seem more confused. I mean, granted, I've never played it, but it what it would take, lose? It might take a long time. It okay. was good. Um, we enjoyed it. It was not something that I disliked. I think my tempered enthusiasm is just that I was excited about it, and I've almost bought it a couple times. Right. And then we played it, and I was like, oh. Gotcha. You know, but Muse has also grown on me, and, and it, I, I know I keep comparing it to that, but... Yeah. At first, when I played Muse as well, this is a combination of other games, but I've held on to it, and we've played it a couple more times. So so that's Shadow's Amsterdam, my number four. And it has nothing to do with Amsterdam. And right. There's all these animals in it. I did, it's very odd thematically. My number four game is so cool. That game is Smartphone Incorporated. I heard about this. Okay. This is the best theme I have seen in years, and that theme is... You are Apple, you are Google, and you're running like a cell phone company. This is a economic Euro game. I hope it leans more in the economic world than it does in just sort of the engine building Euro-y part of it, but you're the CEO of a smartphone company. There's just something that when you have a good theme or a unique theme like that that I get really jazzed about, it's just not the same build a farm. Even though I like I like farming games, it's just so unique and different. But you have a phase where you're changing the price of your cell phones, which impacts everyone else, and sort of this hustle. I think it's something that we all sort of relate to uh, having grown up in the age where there's all of these big tech conglomerates that are sort of forming and... and you know, we've been through the AT&T versus Singular. There's something there that I just, mm-hmm. I think is fun and clever. I'm hoping it's in the game. Obviously, it's weird to like a game just for its theme. You know, you win the game by being the richest player at the end. I just, I'm all in. Smartphone Inc. I think the name is so great. <laughs> it's um, so, yeah, it's so weirdly specific. For yeah. The theme. It's just, how could you not want to play this? <laughs> That's Smartphone Inc. Okay, my number three is Alone by Horrible Games. This is a scenario-based campaign game, and the main draw is that it is a one verse three where three people are playing sort of the evil dungeon master element. So it's almost like a flip of what's typical where you have like one person playing the board and three heroes. One person's the hero and everyone else is against them. So that that hero player sort of can only see one small section of the map at a time, whereas the evil players work together. They can see the entire map and are sort of setting up obstacles to stop the hero from progressing. Plays that over a campaign in a way that seems pretty interesting and that the outcome of each game feeds into the next in a way that I'm not sure how that works exactly. It seems pretty cool. It's it's a novel idea that I'm kind of intrigued by. It it was a Kickstarter game and so having looked at the components, there's kind of a very Kickstarter art vibe to it that I don't love, but I'm intrigued enough by the idea that I'm super interested to see like how it shakes out. Uh, That's Alone. Uh, My number three. There's a lot of role playing in that, right? I don't think so, is there? Well, I don't know. It just seems... I don't know. Maybe. Well, it's funny because I think of role-playing sometimes in the sense that... Oh, I guess they might be. When the DM is the one versus four or one versus three, he has to sort of play... role-play the game. Yeah, play to have fun instead of play to win. Yeah, right. And I I obviously, I know nothing about this game, but that's one of the apparent challenges of designing a game like that. Right, right. It's as much fun as you bring to it. He's the one who won't <laughs> role play, dude. I'm ready. What are we doing? What are we role playing? Are are we playing Fog of Love? Who's who? Oh, we should play. Yeah, so we, we should definitely still do, do that. Um, my next game, my number three game, is by Sebastian Dujardin, uh, the designer of Trois, and art by Vincent Dutre, who's one of the hotter uh, artists. This is Selenia. The thing that I'm interested in this game, aside from the fact that it's got Vincent Dutre doing the art and 
um, the designer of Twa as a designer, is that it's only 16 cards. The entire game is 16 cards. It takes place on this planet of Selenia where I guess this planet doesn't spin. So it's like half the board is light and half the board is dark. But you only have 16 cards. It's sort of like Inish-like in that way. Inish is a game that I should like but don't. But I do like the limited number of cards in Inish and the idea that you know the options that all the players are going to have and you're just trying to strategize based on that. So this is what I'm hoping maybe the Inish that I was hoping Inish would be, if that makes any sense. So uh, that is... <laughs> the Inish... Inish, this is Inish. what I, this is. This is the game that I hoped Inish would be. That's better. Um, so that's Selenia. But don't cut the first part. <laughs> no, of course it's going to stay. <laughs> Great. So this is Selenia, uh, my number three game. Cool. My number three is once again more of a theme than a love of the mechanics because I haven't read the rule book. Uh, this game is called Su Kiji. It is based on a fish market in Tokyo. Um, so there's a fish market in Tokyo called Su Kiji. And it's a very popular uh, tourist destination, but it's also where I've had the best sushi of my entire life. Um, It's where a lot of the raw fish that comes into Japan comes in through this port. And so a lot of people stay up all night to see the auction of the the fish um, every morning. Um, So this is a has that theme. It has cool art, but it's sort of a set collecting commodity speculation game where you're at the Tsukiji fish market. It's done by Asthma Day, and they make great games. This one seems a little bit lighter than the other ones based on the art, but it has little fish tokens, and it, it just looks fun. And I do like set collecting and that commodity speculation where you never know how much something is going to be worth at the end of the game. This is like bidding on the fish in the fish market, is that Yeah. Idea? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, I imagine you'll be interested in this one for sure. Yeah, sounds like a game I'd like. Okay, my number two... Callan was surprised that this didn't make my Gen Con list. That's because I didn't know it was going to be at Gen Con. This is Teotihuacan. This is, I believe, available for sale at Essen. It is by the designer of Tolkien, which is in my top three, probably one of my favorite, absolute favorite games. And that's Daniel Toschini and David Churchy, who's the designer of Anachrony, Tricarian, yeah, and a bunch of other really great yeah. games. This seems like a uh, medium, it's a medium heavy sort of Euro game. And it's sort of like, one of the things that's so striking about it is if you see the board, there's this central, almost sort of like Mahjong tile sort of pyramid made of these wooden tiles with symbols on them. I don't know what that's all about. It looks really <laughs> cool though. Um, but the mechanic for the game is basically that there are action spots where you have three workers that are just represented by dice. And you have to pick a spot to move a worker to, and you pay according to how many other players are at that spot. Uh, You balance that by if you move to a spot where you already have a worker, that action is more effective. So it has that sort of like sulking, like pre-planning component to it, where you want to set up dice in the right order at the right times, the times that other people aren't going to be using those actions. Uh, One of the things I love about sulking is just that thinking like two or three turns ahead and then every turn you get messed up by the next player it's a really cool sort of forward planning system which seems like there are elements of that in this probably not to the same degree but it's also got a really striking art style that's mostly sort of this white just with like touches of color on it i'm so excited about this just because of the Tolkien pedigree and i've been hearing it get on a lot of really strong buzz so yeah uh, yeah that's teo teo khan i'm surprised this is not your number one i would have picked this as your number one it was close my number two is by Matt Eklund, who is the son of Phil Eklund. This is another PAX game. Uh, This is PAX Transhumanity. So because this is a PAX game, that means very dense multi-use cards, which is uh, something I like from the other PAX game I played, which was PAX Renaissance. This touts itself as maybe a little more, not semi-co-op, but from what I understand, you're playing these cards to a shared array. There's some sort of like shared civilization building uh, aspect to it, which is not at all part of the other PAX games. I just love the denseness of PAX games. I always feel like every card, like for example, PAX Renaissance, every card just is full of information. There's like, there's a little bit of a history lesson on, on every card. I just, I just love how deep the PAX games are. So, uh, and this one is a history of the future. I think this is going to incorporate science, sort of like yeah, like city, or... like like city building, or there'll be yeah. something. If it's like any of the other PAX games, there's going to be a lot to read aside from just the cards. There's going to be like a lot of interesting flavor text. That's, I mean, I'm not huge into flavor text in general, but all the PAX games have like very interesting flavor text, and I always feel like I'm getting a super rich experience. And I feel like the games are very deep. So PAX Transhumanity by uh, Matt Eklund. Yeah, just the sci-fi theming of this was so interesting. Yeah, based on the other PAX games, right? Departure of the from yeah, the yeah. PAX games. it seems cool. 
All right, my number two is in the same shared universe as another game I have not played. That other game is Capital Lux. Oh, this was almost on my list. This game is called Rebel Knox. Yeah. It has art from Quan Chi Moria, and it has been described in a small one-sentence description as uh, the resistance with trick-taking. Huh. Which I just. Yeah, I heard it was a, a negotiation trick taking game. Yeah. That sounds uh, great. So you're assigned a faction at the beginning of the game, and, and then you're doing some form of trick taking, which I have no idea how this works. But the promise of a short four to six player game that has resistance like elements with just this beautiful art. I want this right now. You know, Capital Lux is a game I have still not played, but I've read the rules, and I'm, it's just so intriguing. Capital to me. Lux is great. Capital Lux is a fantastic game. Yeah. Yeah. So this just looks like something I'm going to like. I want to buy it. Where can I buy it? <laughs> and the, uh, art, the artist also was the artist on Capital Lux. And the art in Capital Lux is just fantastic. Yeah. Like, look at that. Wow. It's beautiful. What's the company called? Aporta Games. Yeah. They also are the ones who did um, Avenue. Send uh, me yeah. Rebel Knox. <laughs> Rebel Knox. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, my number one is Warpgate um, uh, okay. by Artem Nitsiprov. This is, uh, oh, the company is Wolf Designer. They made Guards of Atlantis, which continues to be, in my mind, criminally underrated. I, f- I see people saying all the time, has any has any board game done a MOBA yet? And no one mentions Guards of Atlantis. Uh, do you even Cloudspire, bro? Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's where I've seen this come up a lot recently. People talking about Cloudspire saying, oh, this is, oh, this is so interesting. I mean, and there are a couple. I mean, Gods of Atlantis isn't even the only one in that space anymore. But Rum and Bones? Rum and Bones is now you do pretty another popular. One. Um, uh, uh, the one that's coming on Kickstarter, whose name I forget, Elo Darkness. Is that what it's called? Anyway. I don't know. Let's we'll just mash some words together. Yeah, crazy. exactly. Manga's Defense of the Stormfire Legends League. <laughs> Ancient. <laughs> of Champions. Uh, okay, Warpgate is a... Uh, you kickstarted this. I did kickstart this, and I'm so excited for it. And I'm actually mildly annoyed because I believe Kickstarter backers can pick this up from Essen. <laughs> so other Kickstarters are getting this this weekend. I'm not getting it. We're not going to have it for BarageCon. We're not going to have it for BarageCon. I know. This is tragic and criminal. But I'm still excited to get this. I hope it's, it'll be by, before the end of the year. It is a 4X-ish game where that plays really, really fast. You, It has a not quite similar, but uh, like Gods of Atlantis, you're playing cards to sort of a array in front of you. But they're not, you're not playing them simultaneously. You play them one by one. You play a card. You choose either the top action or the bottom action on it. And what's really interesting is then on your second turn of the round... You play another card, and that card is twice as powerful. It, you do its action twice or twice as effectively. Third turn, it's three times as powerful. And then the last card you play is four times as powerful. So there's this escalation to the round that just gets ridiculous as you play cards, uh, which just seems like it'll just be really, really fun. Uh, it's supposed to be an extremely fast-playing space 4X game, which is a area I like a lot but is not typically very fast-playing. So um, this seems really, really cool. That's Warpgate by uh, Wolf Designer. We went back and forth on the Kickstarter for this, talking about it a lot, and I can't remember what my reservations were. I, I, the only reservation I had was whether to back it at the six-player version and or not. Did you or did I you actually not? didn't because I just we play yeah. most of our area control games in a group of four, and I don't know if there's any room for a fifth or a sixth player really. Uh, and also, it would just put it into a realm of length that just yeah. doesn't seem worth. Why would you take a fast-paced game and make it a long game? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's Warpgate. All right, so my number one game, I'm I'm worried that it's Kellen's number one game because I feel like it's right up his alley. Uh, this is Forum Trajanum. Are you kidding? And if this you, is what oh, you man. picked. Tra- Trajan uh, is a little clue there as to designer. This is uh, Stefan Feld. Uh, this is supposed to be one of his heaviest games. The early buzz is very good. And I mean, Feld, early in my board gaming career, I stayed away from Feldian games. I just didn't think I was a Feldian guy, but I just I love most of his games. And this is supposed to be, again, one of his heaviest. And there's a drafting aspect to it, which is something I'm intrigued by. So I'm I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to a, a heavy Feld game with drafting. Uh, I don't know much more about it, but those three aspects are enough to, to sell it for me. So this is Forum Trajanum. So, Kellen, I hope I didn't steal your thunder there. Now you have to pick Heavy Feld. Heavy Feld, not your own number one. So this is <laughs> my number one game is based off of the hype for a game that they released either last year or the year before that I have also not played. Right. Um, <laughs> so that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um. So this game is uh, 1906 San Francisco. 
and the publisher is Looping Games. They made a game called 1920 Wall Street something or other. Um, but anyway, the goal of the this series of games is 45 minutes to an hour, tons of interactivity, and I think up to six players. So anyway, 1906 San Francisco has something to do. There was a San Francisco earthquake uh, that was an 8.6 on the Richter scale. So this is a property development game set in San Francisco following that. Because it's under an hour, I love the idea of, I love bigger games in smaller boxes that are highly interactive. This game has a mix of public and private objectives that you're going for, which is always something I really enjoy. And the action selection in it has sort of been compared to king domino in a weird way but which doesn't really make sense which is there are actions that you're choosing on cards but the the action on the furthest to the left is the best action but that means that you'll choose last in the subsequent round that's a cool mechanic i like the mechanic mechanic. um but you can also if you want at any time just sort of pay money to and the farther away you go the more you have to pay in order to do that but there's just something about the buzz from 1920 Wall Street, uh, which is another game I need to check out. Just this one just was percolating near the top. It's not something that you'd think would fit me, Mark. I think you'll like this a lot. It's just my sort of guess. 1920 or 1906? Both. Okay. I mean, just okay. the, the concept of them. Just I like what they're doing. I like the idea of a series of games, sort of like the 18xx games, but that are these smaller boxes a uh, lot of interactivity and a uh, shorter playtime, uh, which is something I'm definitely, definitely always on the lookout for, which is shorter playtime. Is this supposed to be like fairly heavy? Do you know? Yeah, decently heavy. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I've never, I've not heard about this, but this is. We'll have to get 1920 uh, Wall Street. Yeah. Do you have it? No, uh, I haven't even played it. Just hyped for it, man. I'm a hype machine. <laughs> It is. It's weird. It's oh yeah, no, no. It's definitely. Yeah, it's definitely like. Yeah, they're doing their own thing with a 19xx deal. Oh, uh, do they actually call them 19? Yeah, uh, 19xx uh, series. Funny. There's another one coming out, 1921 or something. I don't know. So or it almost feels criminal in a way. Just like take that identity. But anyway, all the 18xx games aren't made by the same company. No. Are they? Wait, are they not? Yeah, no, they're not. I'm sorry, that was I thought a lot more surprised. <laughs> you can't I guess own a have. year, Neilan. Well, I just that just seems like a weird thing. They're no. not all made by the same company. Not at all. I mean, I don't think any company. So makes it's more just like before. that's it's a, a genre. It's a it's genre. It's a genre that I, oh, I didn't know it's that. It's like a, the 18xx series is like train slash stock market and some combination of the two huh. ideas. Learn to train. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've, yeah, that's genuinely surprising. So that it's it's more of like yeah, like a, it's theme a genre, and so, idea. Yeah, a genre. That's, it's like it's like worker placement, okay, sort of thing. Sure. Uh, so that's going to do it for the show. As always, the best thing you can do for us, aside from the aforementioned posting a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find us, is to tell a friend, uh, tell more than one friend, tell as many people as you can, and uh, and just yeah, share the show, uh, spread the word. Uh, get others to uh, enjoy what you're enjoying so very much. You can find us on all the usual social media sites. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Just look up Board Game Barrage and we will be there for you. Yeah, and if you want to talk to us, uh, hit us up at the guild at boardgamebarrage.com slash guild. Yep. We're going to start a post asking for topic suggestions um, because we'd love to cover some of those. And Mark is running out of ideas. (laughs) kidding aside some of our our best episodes have been inspired by you guys so please do if you have any ideas uh, feel free to share them Um, you can email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com or uh, hit us up at twitter Uh, those are other avenues to communicate with us as always a big thank you to uh, heart society for their intro and outro song what's on your mind kid you can find them at heartsocietymusic.com and i think that's going to do it for all you out there at essen enjoy the con let us know how it goes Uh, otherwise we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. I'll be the same. That's German. Nice. Good job. Way to tie it up. Tell us when you want to get back in on the episode. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> tell us. This is all tell cut. Us. God. Every time I get fun, you cut it. (laughs) All right, we'll leave it in. No, well, don't do that. (laughs) Please cut that last bit out. Yeah. Um, So. Okay, so this is your spoiler warning. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Thank you very much, Mark.
I'm going to be talking about spoilers on the campaign for Scythe. Oh, no. I'm going to go in the bathroom. Yeah, I'm closing Mark the door. Mark and I going to talk about this. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> what is that said? Are you running away? Foley work? Foley. <laughs> <laughs> clop, 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 clop. Yeah, like coconuts <laughs> <laughs> riding off. <laughs> I'm not here. <laughs> The biggest and best thing about this campaign, I th- the thing, the one thing that makes this almost an essential purchase, I think, if you did not know this, there are two new factions in this box. I was actually genuinely surprised with this. There are two re- biggish boxes, which is probably a reasonably good clue. But for some reason, when you open one of them and just I see, you see all the minis, it's just there's something surprising about there being that much plastic hidden away from you and it's just there at some point unlocked in the camera. Because, like, you know, if you think about it, a faction is four max, a character... Uh, airship. So it, there's a bunch of stuff that just a suddenly, combat wheel. A combat wheel. Yes, exactly. A bunch of sort of me, you know the meeples, the structures, and everything. So those factions are really interesting additions. One of them has sort of a modifiable start where their mech abilities are sort of semi randomized. You draw sort of a bunch of them and then choose which ones to play. And their factory cards are also single use, but they start the game with a bunch of them. So they're just very versatile and very different every single time you play them. The other faction is this very aggressive faction that has this like leap ability so they can move aggressively across the board and they're incentivized to spread as far as possible because they have these tokens that are worth negative one points for them at the end of the game but the more of them they get out on the board obviously that they get rid of that penalty but also if other players move on top of them they get those negative ones so they sort of spread influence and can sort of block off movement to some extent they just have this very intimidating look about them their mechs are huge twice as big as the other ones they're kind cool of, they're they're cool looking but how are you going to bring this to game night Right, like, well, hey that's guys, kind of the weird in this thing. box, yeah, that that's one of the things that's so weird about a spoiler faction, right? It's like if you sort of break it out and so you are like, oh hey, let's play Scythe. I've got these two new factions, and then someone at the table is like, oh, I was in the middle of the campaign, <laughs> I didn't know that yet. Or like, like rank the factions in Scythe, right? I don't know. It's it's a very strange thing to sort of include such a major component because to me that's the main draw. I mean, they did a whole expansion that was just two new factions, and this is that again. The other modules less interesting. Some of them are sort of like randomized setups for like mods that you'd change your mech abilities, things that would just give you one-time bonuses, ways to change the objective scoring track. Not a huge fan of those. There is a cooperative module which surprised me uh, i haven't tried that yet but would be interested to try it and there's you know roaming monsters and stuff like that so nothing sort of mind-blowing the factions are to me the main draw the other modules were interesting over the course of revealing them in the course of the campaign but not something i would necessarily go back to and play with the thing that's become apparent is also that scythe has become increasingly more wonky with all of these additions i think we've spoken about the airships and how they sort of just inherently imbalance some factions in weird ways I think the more of the stuff that you layer onto the game, the game sort of deteriorates. We spoke about this last week. It was just like the optimal way to play it. For me, the optimal way to play Scythe is with the base rules and just all of the factions at your disposal. I probably wouldn't include airships. I probably wouldn't... I haven't tried that many of the alternative ending conditions, which seem interesting. But anyway, that's, that's my sort of long and short take of Scythe, at least in the current end state, if there are no more expansions truly coming. Pretty happy with it. Overall, like I said, I want to play more games of Scythe just with these new factions. How um, long was the campaign? How many games? The campaign was eight games. Okay. Yeah. And Scythe is a pretty fast-moving game, especially at two players. Right. Like, it takes us like an hour and a half. So you don't have that legacy sort of wear or that concern with, with the legacy game sometimes when it's, you know, 12 or 14 games that you have to, like, yeah, really get through. So exactly. eight, eight games seems Eight easy. games is good. And actually, the, w- one of the things that's smart is that some of the scenarios are actually really short just in the way that they're designed. So okay. we would finish them in, like, 45 minutes and then almost be tempted to just go straight into the next one that's cool so yeah it's it's definitely a pretty quick experience just to get you into all the modules and still be pretty compelling yeah i think that's gonna that's gonna wrap up my thoughts on scythe the rise of fenders spoiler alert over you are now entering a spoiler free zone (laughs) (laughs) all right kellen loves my jokes